Uh, I'm here to actually talk about the uh, summer camp organization that I run. Uh, as we mentioned, I've been the leadership track director for Camp Quest West, uh, which is our high school leadership program for the, for the older campers that are coming to our program. And we also serve uh, anywhere from 8 to 17 years old. So your, uh, your granddaughters, your daughters, your, your children who want to have a fun week at a summer camp, that's the experience that we're trying to provide. Uh, this year I've taken on our director of operations as well, so signing insurance paperwork and cutting checks has been taken on as part of my responsibilities. Um, before I dive into kind of explaining the talk and, and giving this kind of prepared piece, I wanted to ask um, who has familiarity and exposure to Camp Quest generally? I know Greg does, because he's been there and he's amazing. Okay, we've heard about it. Okay, so Camp Quest as a national organization was founded in 1996 in Kentucky, um, specifically relating to Boy Scouts not allowing um, non-religious members. So if you were a member of the Boy Scouts, you had to attest that I believe in God and I'm going to follow the Scout motto, etc., etc. Uh, and a lot of people from Kentucky found this unfair and wanted to provide some sort of outdoor residential summer camp experience um, that uh, provided space for non-religious children. Uh, so they got together in 1996 and they had 20 kids uh, and that has expanded uh, nationally and internationally. Uh, and Camp Quest West, which is the affiliate that I work for, is one of the uh, largest camps. We have two locations. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but basically every year about 300 kids come and we put them through your very traditional summer camp, archery, canoeing, hiking. Uh, and then we also throw in a very humanist, skeptic, science-oriented component um, and, and try to build the community that, that you all have here um, from the ground up from much younger age. Um, so uh, I'm not really like a, a typical speaker that comes to events like this, I don't think. Uh, previously when I've given this talk, it's a venue for like PhDs to talk about their research. And I came in to talk about a, a summer camp. Um, and so I think it went well. And that, that's the talk that I'm going to give you all here. Um, before I do that, before I dive into Camp Quest and this wonderful thing, I have, a, I have an important question for the audience, and that question is, do you like pineapple on your pizza? So if you, if you like pineapple on pizza, raise your hand. It depends. If you don't like pineapple on your pizza, raise your hand. Okay, okay. So I asked this question to my... 15 year olds at summer camp, right? We're, we're doing an activity on critical thinking and on logical fallacies. And it was hot, and they didn't get it, they didn't care about a red herring versus a no true Scotsman versus a yada, yada, yada. And they're 15, it's hot. They, well, who cares about these, what these things are called? But I asked that question pineapple on pizza, and much like the room here, but a little more animated, they were just like, no, it's gross. Don't, I don't like it. Or, oh yes, I love it. I love pineapple on everything, all the time. So we split the group in half. And we said, those of you, I'm not going to ask you all to do it, but those of you who like pineapple on your pizza, go over here. Those of you who hate it, go over here. And you have one minute to elect a champion, and you're going to come out in the middle, and you guys are going to argue about whether you should have pineapple on pizza. And they loved it. And they come out and they start making their arguments. It's gross, it's disgusting, it's a fruit, it whatever. And when they start making these bad arguments and these red herrings and these no true Scotsmans and they start insulting each other, I'm sitting there with my camp whistle going like, ad hominem, you're out, send in a new champion. Right? And we get them involved in the argument. Uh, and my wife was there and she, she notices that of this large group of about 20 kids, you know, 10, 15 of them are kind of into the, the game that we're playing, and another group is, is just sitting out. And she says, well, what about these kids that don't care? And so I said, who here just doesn't care about pineapple on pizza? And I'll ask you the same question. Who doesn't it matter to you, really? Right? You said sometimes. It depends on what else is on the pizza. Totally, right? Yeah. Um, and so we had a, you know, who doesn't care about this argument? You're a third group. You're the neutrals. Now you have to send in a candidate and you have to make your position for like why is this even a topic that we're talking about, right? So when we, put the, we put the cons on the side. We said, okay, you, 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 those of you who are anti-pineapple, go over there. The don't cares and the yeses, we're going to have an argument here for a minute. And eventually you reach the coalition of 
If you want pineapple on your pizza, it's allowed, but it's a sometimes thing. It doesn't have to be on everything. And we suddenly had, you know, 15 kids on this side and five hardliners. No. <laughs> pineapple on pizza is disgusting. Okay, make your argument to this, to this group here. And they make their arguments, they're going back and forth. Eventually, it's two kids, two hardliners. And, and one of the two raised their hand and says, when you say pizza, do you mean real pizza or like pizza you get from Domino's? And I was like, well, what is real pizza? And he's like, well, you know, in Italy with the, with the oven and it's got the whatever. And I was like, no, just like Domino's mountain meat pizza that you get everywhere. And he goes, oh, walks over to the other side of the group. Right? So got one kid, hardliner. Tell me why we should not allow pineapple on pizza. It's, it's gross. It's disgusting. I don't like it. No one should like it. It's unnatural. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's not how pizza's intended to be. And another camper from this group, you know, raises their hand and, and steps up and says, Guys, isn't this like the gay marriage stuff you see on TV? It's the same argument. Now, that camper was very unhappy. <laughs> but it's true, right? And that was the point of the, the lesson that we had developed was to um, put them in a situation to, to make a very silly argument about pineapple and about pizza, but to come to an understanding about how arguments work and what they mean and what you hear in a, a much broader sense in the world. Um, and so the, the process that this goes through is something that's called emergent learning. Um, and this is what we do when we develop curriculum every year for, for Camp Quest. Um, I'm sure everyone here is very familiar with the um, basic, you know, the scientific method, right? And emergent learning follows a, a very similar process. You, you start with your hypotheses, you do some sort of experiment, you identify a truth, you come to conclusions, and then you retest the hypotheses and you go in a circle, right? We get the kids in a group, we give them tools and we give them a scenario, we give them some sort of activity, and then they come to the conclusions themselves. And they own what they have learned and can take that, not just for that week or that day or that hour of activity, but they can take that home and use those tools for their, the rest of their life. Um, I think that this is really the secret sauce of what makes Camp Quest very different than a traditional sleepaway summer camp where you do your archery and when I did Boy Scouts as a child we had shotgunning and we had canoeing and and we had leather working but I didn't bring home anything more than how to start a fire and how to tie some really great ropes and you know I, I could ask Greg for that today really so I should probably should amazing stuff um, so one of the things that we look at when I'm looking at developing crit criteria and curriculum for camp is, um, is what is what are the youth enthusiastic about? One of the things that we have noticed with Camp Quest and with kind of a broader society at large is that interest in, in science has really increased with younger generations. Um, my father, uh, not this audience here, but my father's father, um, their interest in, in scientific principles has not really stayed particularly strong, they have broader interests, um, but when you get down to my generation, my younger brother's generation, and now these eight and ten year olds who we're doing the summer camp with, science is what they're interested in, especially in the media that they consume, which is what this report comes from. A KQED, the local, um, the local station, just did like a survey media poll to identify like, what media you're consuming, what topics is it in, and the younger generations are very, very, very interested in science. Um, what is interesting about that is that when you ask about actual scientific knowledge, they don't have it. So when we ask about things like, do you believe that the world is round or flat, despite the older generations having a less general interest in science, they have a better grasp and understanding of the answer to that question. For the younger kids, 66% uh, of 18 to 24 year olds actually express doubt about, yeah, it's probably maybe round, but maybe it's not, maybe, maybe it's, you know, I've seen some YouTube videos that have been really convincing, right, because that's the media that they consume. It's a science video, sure, 
It's about a scientific topic, but it's not strong critical thinking material. Uh, and this actually stands true for a lot of other subjects. Um, uh, as the humanist organization here, you're probably aware that in the last 10 years that the belief or acceptance, the people that say that I have a strong religious belief has declined dramatically and that the people who, who respond no belief or no religious you know, church that I belong to has gone from I think 4 8% in 2008 to about 26% today, right, of people who respond no religious affiliation. Um, but that step away from religion does not mean that you step into science and critical thinking and having an appreciation for gathering of the facts before you make a decision about something. Um, and so, uh, for example, millennials, um, my generation and people just younger than me, um, are 44 percent likely to believe that astrology is sort of or very scientific. Uh, for uh, adults that are older than 35 years old, um, that figure is 34 percent. And this fluctuates over time, but right now in this, in this volume of media and consumption that we're in, the younger generations are more likely to believe in astrology. Uh, they're much, much more likely to get involved in some sort of multi-level marketing scheme like doTERRA or Amway or essential oil sales or, or, or uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's got her goop thing going out, which is this uh, uh, women empowerment using bad science and all sorts of like pseudo-medical fake treatments. She's got a Netflix special coming out now. Um, and people really buy into it because it sells this very strong pro-social message, but the actual science and material is, is really not there for the majority of this stuff. Um, so we have this generation who are very interested in the topic of science. They're very involved in uh, climate activism and things of this nature, um, but they don't have the training and the skills to, to really recognize bad arguments from good arguments or appreciate valid science from invalid science, they're, they're very much following um, you know, social media, very much following, following videos, and it becomes problematic. Um, it becomes problematic because we create community online, and if that community is founded on nonsense, you have found a group of people that you can identify with. We've all found a group of people here that we can identify with and share community with. I think that's one of the purposes of this group. But when you have poor information, you still get the same pro-social value. Uh, so the, the QAnon folks, is everyone familiar with QAnon? No. QAnon is this online conspiracy theory that the President of the United States brilliantly is working with the shadow mastermind government in order to, you know, destroy all the aliens and all just kind of, it's crazy nonsense stuff, but it essentially rates back to a lot of the conspiracy theories that, that went into his election and the, that just built up from there. So these folks show up at the rallies and they're like very vitriolic about how he's doing a great job of like rooting out the secret Illuminati and the government, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is a group of essential oil multi-level marketing folks and they get together online and, and you know like work out ways to share their experiences and get all their friends in a group and sell them their essential oils and you know do I have an oil for that and Alex Jones of Infowars or you know the anti-vaccination movement is very strong but it's a very social environment you, you get together online or in person with your friends and talk about your experiences trying to get your kid you know, enrolled in school without getting a vaccination and how you can circumvent that and how you can do this, that, and the other. Um, or you have uh, racial realists, racists online who talk about uh, all sorts of bad statistics and whatnot, but you build this social identity online that kids get involved with and, you know, they have their friends and they have their inside jokes and they have this community of people and that's what they're looking for. They're looking for the pro-social engagement, the validation, um, and the, the information that comes with it. 
is, you know, it's an identifier. Like, I have a cool tattoo, you have a cool tattoo, we can be friends. I believe this weird, crazy thing, you believe this weird, crazy thing, it sets us apart, it makes us different. Um, that guy there? This guy? Uh, that guy, what's his name? I have it in my notes here. Um, I don't know, he's this, I, I had the name, he's this super racist, race realist, he's a prolific, um, far, far right blogger and uh, public speaker who talks about, you know, pretty gross things like, uh, you know, white people have the best IQ and therefore we shouldn't be mixing with other people, but it's not racist, it's just realistic IQ stuff and we should be keeping other people separate and maybe not let them into the country and and then he hangs out with people that you know are the gun toting real scary folks but he's not he's not like that he just they invite him to speak and he speaks at their things but he's not one of them you know it's just very hangs out with the president kind of person right <coughs> um, but so the the thing about engaging in these beliefs is that they don't cost you anything right um, I, I talked about kids who kind of believed that the earth might be flat earlier. Um, and I don't think anyone here in the room does, but if you did, it does, it's not going to lose you your job unless you work at JPL or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> and even then, it might not lose you your job, because if you do the math well, great, right? You just have some weird way of, of thinking that the math works in your head. Um, so you can have all kinds of crazy belief, uh, and, it, and it won't harm you uh, necessarily. Uh, this guy, uh, this is Kyrie Irving. Um, Kyrie Irving is a phenomenal NBA player. I think he's 28 years old at this point. Uh, in 2016, he got pretty popular for sinking the three-pointer in Game 7 of the finals that won it for the Warriors. And um, he is also on record as believing that the Earth is flat. He went out on, like, Instagram and Facebook and he was on the radio and he was you know oh yeah we're earth totally flat I watched some cool YouTube videos it's a thing and of course he's a very prominent figure so he got a lot of backlash for it and so he walked it back with an apology and the apology was well do your own research right not really a, so you know over the years people have asked him do you still really think the earth is flat and he's never really said no I totally realize that it's a oblate spheroid no, he just says, well, I didn't mean to cause a lot of controversy. I think you should do your own research. There's videos on YouTube you can watch, which, of course, are, you know, there's not a lot of content out there spending time saying the Earth is round, but there's a lot of weirdos being like, it's flat. Look at the shadows. You can tell over here. This video has been faked because of blah, 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 you know. Um, but so he, he's not going to get fired from the Celtics for believing that the Earth may or may not be a planet. Um, it, he's a basketball player. He plays basketball very well. He's going to continue to to do so. Uh, but when we talk about something like anti-vaccination, suddenly the costs of having involved yourself with this community um, go up, right? And uh, and children start getting hurt. And uh, it's no secret that the anti-vaccination movement has done some very serious harm to communities in the United States and communities nationally. Uh, diseases that we have once considered eradicated have come back, right? Um, and, and as a society, we're reacting to this. We're engaging in additional information and training and um, getting the word out about the value of vaccines. There are states that are looking at enacting bans. You can no longer use religious exemption, for example, as a reason to opt out of vaccination. I think New Jersey is looking at a bill for that sense. Um, but the, the, we shouldn't need to have legislation to the effect that says it's scientifically valid to vaccinate your child against a disease, and doing so prevents other kids who cannot be vaccinated due to uh, illness or being very, very young from uh, catching an infectious disease, right? Like, that's just a very, the evidence is there to support it. It's a pro-social behavior. We should all probably do it. We shouldn't have to drag you kicking and screaming into doing so. Um, but there's no community that necessarily is around and says, hey, that's, as a community, that's just a thing we do. We don't need to make a legislation about it. That's just the expectation of our community that we'll be good citizens 
and good uh, ushers of science, right? Um, so what do we do when there is this uh, conspiracy mindset that allows you to, to stand apart from others, to identify a community of your own, and um, basically have friendships. You know, you get to be a unique individual and express yourself, and this provides a lot of pro-social value and has very lim limited blowback until, until it has very serious true blowback. Um, th what is the, the vaccine that we can provide uh, to, to fight against conspiracy theory? and to engage with building a um, social environment that is very positive towards science and that uses the information that it collects and gathers to make strong cognitive decisions about the society that we live in. Um, I think that we, we often, uh, I consider myself to be a skeptic as my title, and you all can be humanists. I think that the, the Venn diagram of those is basically a circle in my opinion, but that's the term I like to use. Um, and, and as a skeptic, I often tell myself that, that if I can just give people critical thinking and I can just give people the analytical reasoning tools, uh, then, then they'll, be, they'll be vaccinated against being conspiratorial and having these mindsets that are not necessarily the most positive. Um, but I think we've spent a very long time, the last 20 years particularly, pushing that critical thinking. If I can just give you the tools, You'll be smart like me, right? And I'm not being a rude person by saying that. Totally. Why are you mad? Why are you looking at me like that? It doesn't work that way. Um, and so, what we really need is this motivation to be rational. We need a pro-social impetus that says, if you're rational, you get a benefit from me socially. I'll benefit you socially. We have a community. Um, and so, there's studies that have looked at this. Uh, these are some modified graphs of that. Uh, this comes from a study in 2018 uh, that talks about um, the, the requirements to actually shift someone's opinion on a, on a topic. Um, what they looked at were people, you know, they have tests and surveys and ways to identify, you know, are you a, a high, smart, analytical thinking individual or is there some sort of, you know, they call it low cognitive ability. Um, and they, they ran them through a, a gamut of surveys on do you believe in ghosts, do you believe in palm reading, do you believe in astrology, and, and like what are your paranormal or conspiracy beliefs. And uh, they found, quite rightly, that you know, the, the lower your cognitive ability, um, the more likely you are actually to believe in these things. But when you looked at high cognitive ability, there wasn't that big of a shift. Um, it's right across here. You just... I have paranormal beliefs, I'm not smart, I'm smart, not a big shift in the blue line, uh, low cognitive ability for conspiracy thieves, not, not a big shift, right, that's the blue line. Um, but when they asked them moral questions about their moral reasoning for believing in something, and they ran them through some basic, like, why do you believe in this thing, like, what value are you getting out of whatever the belief is, you know, oh, you want people to be safer. That's the moral reasoning. So if people are to be safer, then what should we need to do? And they would walk them through these exercises, and then they would go back and, and ask them the questions again. And when people were provided a motivation, a moral motivation, a moral underpinning for expressing rationality and di diving into the facts and figures, then they actually did see a decline in shift in the person's views on these paranormal or conspiratorial topics. Um, the, the takeaway that I took from, from this literature um, is that when we control for people's ability to think critically and be analytical, um, it's actually the, the moral motivation that moves the target. Um, so we can't just provide critical thinking blanket. We can't just provide the tools. We can't give you a pamphlet. We can't give you a book. We can't say watch this Richard Dawkins video, right? It's not sufficient unless you just want to build like rational robots and we can all become data from Star Trek and wonder what it's like to be human and never quite get there, right? Um, this is a quote from the study. When the motivation to form your beliefs based on logic and evidence is not there, 
people with high cognitive ability are just as likely to believe in conspiracies, paranormal phenomena, as people with lower cognitive ability. Um, I never like the way that that's phrased, lower cognitive ability, because it's just numbers on a test. Um, but when you, when you have the motivation, the moral motivation to look at logic and evidence and take that all in and then make a determination on a subject, um, it's just the studies find that your belief in the paranormal and your belief in conspiracy theories decline. Uh, that's great. So, what does this have to do with a summer camp that I teach and work at every year, right? Um, I can see it. But the thing is, if you take it back to the, the pineapple on pizza question, right? Uh, I didn't show up and say, here's a sheet, here's all the definitions of bad arguments, rememorize these, now we're done, right? I just made them argue with each other in a fun way. And I called out when the arguments were bad and, you know, we, we had the definitions given previously. And they got to argue and they got to have that emergent learning experience and internalize all of that as a group and as a community. So they have the community reinforcement now when they're talking amongst each other in their peer groups to you know, somebody's going to make an argument where that's unnatural, that's gross, that's fruit and doesn't belong on a pizza, and somebody else can say, well, tomatoes are a fruit. Do they belong on pizza? And, you know, they have the tools now to communicate amongst each other and reinforce without colliding and fighting and arguing and, and talking past each other. Um, other activities that we do at camp reinforce these in less cognitive ways. Um, it's about building a community where all of this science is, is foundational. We don't teach you a science class, right? Science is what the foundation of the camp is based on, and we teach you how to be a community. Um, my wife's going to be embarrassed because she's right there and she's also right here. But uh, this is my favorite, 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 most favorite thing we have ever done uh, at our at our camp and we, we came up with it because we had too many popsicle sticks and too much free time uh, So we challenged these kids these these high schoolers in our, our leadership track program uh, to build a bridge uh, And that was it they had popsicle sticks. They had some glue and I think there were a few other materials and being teenagers They immediately started trying to like cheat the system and they're like, okay, which one of you is the shortest and weighs the least? And they're going to, you know, build a bridge. If somebody has to stand on it, make sure it doesn't collapse in like 10 seconds. That was a challenge for the week. And immediately they're, they're like, okay, well, like, you take off your jacket. And who's this tall? We're, can we use a little kid? Can we use an eight-year-old as our kid? You know, they're having all these debates. So we, we limit it. And we say, my, my wife says, no, you have to hold me between a chair for 20 seconds. It's got to hold me at the end of the week. And... So, you know, they break off into their groups and they spend a few days, like an hour each day, doing this activity. It was the only time of the week that we actually got a break, so it was phenomenal. Um, and they come back, and the first group, not featured here, had built this very nice suspension bridge out of Popsicle and, and whatnot. And, and she stepped on it, and it immediately just folded in half, and then sort of hung there for a second, and then broke. And the other group of kids come in exactly like you see here. They're cheering, they're screaming, we're gonna win, we're gonna win, we're gonna do it. We put their bridge down and she steps on it. You can see it's got this deep bend in it. And these guys, I love his little face right here. He's so worried that this bridge that they put together is gonna shatter and she's gonna like break her hip in the fire pit or something like that. And then it stays and it holds. And I've never seen a group of like would-be engineers so excited that their popsicle stick bridge had not collapsed, right? Um, and loading into this, we, we had a, a staff member who was an engineer that gave them some tips on like load bearing and the you know triangle shapes versus circular shapes versus straight popsicle stick bridge. And they just they went with what they thought would work for the challenge, and it worked and it succeeded. And I, I have a video somewhere which <laughs> legally I can't show people, but they're just like chant they're woo 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 woo. They, they actually took the opposing bridge and put it in the fire and burned it in effigy. Maybe not the most um, adult response, but absolutely a, a community response for sure. Uh, we, we, we build this community of memories using these scientific principles, and it's 
they'll leave with the memory of the community, they'll leave with the memory of what we've accomplished, but they'll also have the, the scientific knowledge that, that it builds. Um, this is a, the webcomic XKCD, if anyone is familiar. Uh, I think that this particular comic really captures the spirit that we try to embody at Camp Quest, and I personally try to embody as just my, my ethos in life. Um, and Randall Monroe, who's the author, says, uh, I try not to make fun of people for admitting they don't know things, um, because for each thing everyone knows by the time they're adults, every day there are on average 10,000 people in the U.S. hearing about it for the first time, right? And he does some math here showing his, showing his numbers. Um, but if I make fun of people for, for not knowing that thing everyone knows, uh, I train them not to tell me when they have those moments. And I miss out on the fun. And then his characters here, the Diet Coke and Mentos thing, what's that? And he says, oh man, come on, we're going to the grocery store. Right? This is an opportunity to, to teach someone something new that they've never experienced before. Whereas if my reaction to the Diet Coke and Mentos thing, which I can explain if you don't know what it is, uh, is like, you haven't heard of that? Oh, pfft, where were you in 2005? Right? And then their response to me is like, well, you're kind of a dick. All right, I'm not going to work with you. Um, so you know, we, we want to engage like, oh, we did this really great thing in summer camp. It was super cool. What did you guys do? Oh, we made like bottle water rocket things that shot 200 feet in the air. How does that work? Let's go to the store and find out, right? Like that's the community environment that we want to build. And from that we can, oh, rockets, rockets go up into space, rockets orbit the planet. Oh, orbiting works like this, so you go really fast and then you just keep missing the planet over and over again. And uh, that's how we know that the planet is actually a sphere and not flat. And people are like, oh, that makes sense. Show me a YouTube video about that. Okay, cool. I'll do that. Uh, other activities that we do, um, really enjoyable. Uh, we work round the clock as volunteers. Uh, I have a curriculum group of about 10 volunteers right now who are reviewing past material and identifying new material of what we actually want to do and teach at Camp Quest this year. Um, last year we, we did cardboard boat racing, so we talked about Archimedes principle and water displacement and then we gave them so much duct tape and so much cardboard and they had a week to build themselves boats so they could race across the swimming pool. Uh, this is the group that, that won, their boat made it across, everyone else sunk and drowned. Uh, <laughs> but it's fun, right? And they, they learn about and they compete and they challenge. Um, we do stargazing, so we have a telescope that I believe someone from this organization may have donated. Um, and we have a couple of telescopes, and we do star talks two nights of the week. We go out, we sleep out under the stars, and look at the constellations, and tell stories from different cultures when they looked at those constellations. Um, you know, the, the Greeks have their whole pantheon of gods in the skies. We talk about Inca myths another year, about how the Incas viewed the, the starscapes and the different constellations, what they called them as they rise across the sky. Um, Richard Wade from uh, Ask an Atheist does his science talks. He comes up every year um, pro bono in his free time and spends a weekend and gives his amazing dinosaur or astronomy or uh, you know another, this is how we know the earth is round talk. Um, and we, you know, we engage the kids in levers and pulleys and all sorts of great mechanisms. Um, so science, technology, engineering, math, um, it all becomes foundational in the just sleep away summer camp activities that we perform. Um, my personal favorite uh, is, uh, I think doing it, the kids don't quite get it, but when they see the photos later, we do UFO fake sightings. So they build themselves out of like pie tins and you know, whatever, a UFO, and then we go out and then they use parallax to try to fake a UFO flying overhead. This is one of the better examples. You just shop out, Photoshop out the little strings holding a UFO together and suddenly kids getting abducted at camp and it's a lot of fun, right? Um, and we'll do community service projects. We'll go down and, and, you know, clear a path or build a dam for the creek, whatever the property owners are asking us to do that year. Um, or we'll, we do like leadership conversations. So this is a, this is a camper who's, who's writing down the different leadership styles of, of, of people. I think this is uh, Barack Obama is a leader. Dr. Evil is a leader, but he's a mean leader. Um, 
Harvey Milk is somebody that a camper actually volunteered when I ran that. Harvey Milk was a leader who was involved in the community. It was a really great example. Um, so we, we talk about all these things and we get them involved. Um, it's been a really wonderful program. Um, one of the slides is not loading here, but the community engagement of bringing in kids from all over the country and all these different walks of life is something that we actively look for. Currently, um, as the uh, director of ops, we've been scoping, I've been scoping um, an LA County foster youth program that is uh, open to providing camperships, essentially a scholarship to attend camp for those who can't afford it. We can bring in inner city, um, lower income campers who get to experience the same thing and it's not just limited to suburban folks who can afford to send their kids away for a couple of weeks although we love having them as well um, the kids that come to camp are the smartest people I've ever met in my life uh, no offense to the room here I'm sure you're all very 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 smart but I had an eight-year-old who had memorized the periodic table of elements and knew what all the covalent bonds were so wow um, it's it's impressive and so every year I have to challenge myself to come up with experiments and things to do and hands-on activities that they don't know about yet and then I get there and then they know things that I've never heard of becomes a real challenge um, and yeah so to recap I guess uh, at Camp Quest West Camp Quest National we're, we're really striving to build uh, at the at the youngest age this internalized motivation to be rational and then building a community around them that they have for the rest of their lives that motivates them to continue that rationality in their broader communities uh, and, and we do this by by making science and science education the foundation of Camp Quest and then making how to be a good member of your community what we're actually teaching. Uh, and so if there are any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them. And I think we have a microphone to pass around for that purpose. So in these competitions you had, mm -hmm. like building the bridge or getting a boat to go across the pool, did you determine what made the difference between those people who were successful and those who didn't? Time, mostly. Yeah, in that particular, the boating incident. Uh, so we have a we have a free time period every week during the during the actual camp activities, and the the challenge here was not only do you have the principles, but are you willing to devote the time to get involved and, and build a boat? Um, the kids that a sat down and planned something in advance rather than just cutting cardboard and then trying to glue it together and then seeing if it made a boat. The kids that actually sat down and said, how much do you weigh? How much surface area do we need to cover and plan something out? Definitely were the ones who succeeded. Um, and there were a few other that got close and the boats just got waterlogged and it was a matter of not having enough duct tape or not having enough support in the bottom of the boat for the weight of the kid that they'd put in. Um, and we have debriefing sessions pretty much after every one of our activities. We, we plan this in, at least for the, the leadership kids who are older and can really offer strong feedback and, and take that in, to talk about why do you think that didn't work, um, which I think is a really important part of any kind of program, but especially a leadership program that we try to run um, because we ask a lot of them and they fail fairly frequently which is allowed. It's the way that I view our, our leadership program in particular is a pressure cooker for adulthood. So we put them in very adult situations. We ask them to help with kids that aren't sleeping at night or help serve food and help run assemblies and things like that. And uh, it's very scary and they don't, don't always do it well. And we debrief and say, how did that go? What could we have done better? How do we improve that? and allow them to fail safely so that they can succeed when they leave camp and actually go back to their communities. I've got a question on how big is Camp Quest nationwide? How many kids attend per year? And how fast, when did this start? How fast has it grown? And yeah. uh, what do you see for growth in the future? Uh, yeah, so the... 
camp was founded in 1996. Um, I don't have answers to specific, all those specific questions since uh, I've only been involved with West and I've only been involved since 2012. Um, but broadly, Camp Quest was founded in 1996, had 20 kids, um, moved to Ohio. I think they had 40 kids following that. The Ohio program now is, I think, 150 kids a year. Um, there are 13 U.S. affiliates. There's an affiliate in the U.K. and there's an affiliate in Norway. Um, West, the organization that I work with, has about 300 kids a year between the two locations that we offer. And Northwest, I think, is the second largest with 150. Um, and then there are other organizations that might only have 30 kids uh, every year that are still getting off the ground. So in total, I would spitball maybe 500 to 1,000, depending on you know, economic climate and whether kid, people can afford to send their kids or they're concerned about a recession or something. Um, but I don't have the, the raw figures. Um, but yeah, we've expanded to 15 locations, I think, in the last 20 years. Um, West started at a, with 20 kids in 2008 in Northern California and filled that campground in, within, when well, I started in 2008, and my first year was 2012. So in, in six years, they'd grown from 20 kids to 100 kids. There were no extra beds, so staff like myself were just literally sleeping in a field somewhere. Um, and so we expanded that site to uh, two weeks back to back, so we could kind of do like 90 and 90 kids, which is what we're expecting this year. And then the Southern California facility um, it had hold up to 300 campers. We have about 150 every year. So between our two sites, we do about 150 and 150 campers. We're the largest of the affiliate programs, and those other affiliate programs are continuing to, to grow. You have a question, Reva? No, oh. oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> we'll do Mike and then yeah. pass it to Reva. No, I, Okay. I thought your uh, piece on the belief groups mm -hmm. was kind of interesting and, in you know, the dynamics mm -hmm. of how they form. And it made me stop and wonder, um, how does any of that may, may or may not apply to this group of people right here now? Yeah. Um, well, let me ask the, the group here how generally... Uh, I mean, I think Jeff or if anyone else, how do you bring in members <coughs> aside from offering talks like this? I mean, it's kind of a challenging question, right? Sina? Well, I'm a skeptic. Wait a minute. Hold it. She can't talk unless she's got the mic. Remember? Excuse me. Let me the mic. If you're asked. Let's take Sina. Thank you. Yeah, well, I've been with this group for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have uh, a lot of things, things. We have book groups and video groups mm -hmm. like this. And, and, uh, every Sunday morning we have a, a lunch and a talk, a speaker. Um, we're on Meetup. Mm -hmm. We have a, a, a newsletter. Um, we have a, 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 a potluck in somebody's home every month different people's homes. Um, we do lots of stuff. We have a social action committee, which is very active. Mm. And on and on. We, <laughs> whatever we can think of, and we try to keep the things going that we started, with, even though there's a change. Yeah, so um, we try to do a lot of the same things to engage campers. Um, but we, we operate single week, three single week sessions. Um, there are the dates uh, for parents to, to send their kids or to volunteer as staff like I do. Um, the opportunity to engage outside of camp for us is um, something that we're still exploring because we don't have a physical location like this to meet up all the time. There are a lot of, we pull from a lot of different groups with a lot of different um, views and opinions. One of the things about Camp Quest 
uh, West in particular, the, the culture that we've created is that um, while it started, especially Camp Quest, as a place for non-religious uh, parents who have, you know, I think the official phrase that they use is children of non-religious parents, which is really a mouthful, um, but it's, it's a place to, to send your kids that doesn't have like a pastor or a preacher or morning prayer or something like that. Um, and so some camps really lean into that. That's very much the, the thesis. Um, and what we culturally try to create is I, I don't care what you believe, if you're Muslim or an atheist or a Buddhist or a Sikh or I don't, we don't care, just come and we're going to put you in a boat and we're going to make you try to swim across with duct tape, right? And you're going to have fun. Um, and so, you know, do we show up at events like this? Should we go to Sikh community centers? Should we go to Muslim community centers and Christian community centers? Um, should we advertise at basketball games? You know, we'll take anyone that wants to have a good time and is interested in their kids learning community values and critical thinking. What's the cost per session? Cost. So Alfred's asking the, the cost per session. Question if you're going to take yeah. Yeah. That, that's actually my question. What are the economics of it? Uh, also, yeah. who, uh, how do you get the land uh, for it? Yeah, so there, um, so the cost per session is, um, we've set it this year. We have tiered pricing, first of all, so we try to make it available not just for families that can afford it but for anyone who wants to send their kid. Uh, so the primary pricing tier is $769 for a full week session uh, for per camper. Uh, it's about the median price for a residential summer camp in the United States. Um, we try to keep it down so we're an entirely volunteer organization. The costs just cover um, we're ACA accredited, it's Marion King Camping Association, so we have to make sure that we hit insurance and coverage ratios for staff. Our staff are all CPR certified. We, we cover the training for that. We do background checks. We do fingerprinting. Um, and so our, all of our costs are associated with either the land rental, insurance, training, or um, like staff supervision and, and materials, just all the background costs. Um, Food, yeah. Food is actually the largest thing. Uh, Eight-year-olds, ten-year-olds, fifteen-year-olds, they eat a lot. Uh, and we structure those meals three times a day and give them a nap time, and they still just drive us ragged. Um, but it's, it's a ton, ton, ton of fun. Um, in terms of the overall operational costs, um, you know, a lot of stuff actually just comes out of my pocket or other volunteers' pockets. Um, you know, the hula hoops. Then we're trying to do an activity with, you know, uh, we'd lay out hula hoops on the ground and we do like a rock, paper, scissors off and kids have to hop on one leg towards each other and then they rock, paper, scissors and if they fall over they lose the rock, paper, scissors, they got to go back to the beginning and they have to work out some kind of strategy to communicate with each other what they're going to throw so the head behind them is like ready to run and, and um, we want to do something fun like that and we realize we only have five hula hoops, we've got to buy ten more and usually I'll just buy ten hula hoops and just ship them to the storage facility that we have and you know, maybe I'll ask for a reimbursement or not, but my primary goal is just I want 10 hula hoops to run a fun activity, and then we can make something up the next year and use them again. I have a I'm question. I'm curious why you asked the question about pineapple on pizza, it, because it has a very simple scientific <laughs> answer, and it's a really stupid question. It's a stupid question, absolutely a stupid question. Uh, it's stupid for a reason because there's no there's no stakes. I could have asked who here believes that you know who here is pro-choice or, or pro-life, and that would have been a hell of a debate for some 15-year-olds to have, and it would have been real heavy, and I probably would have gotten very heated and very emotional. Or given the group of kids that we pull from, there would have been everyone was pro-choice, and there wasn't a debate to be had. Um, whereas Pineapple on pizza is kind of a joke internet thing that's been going around for a few years. Uh, another version of the pineapple on pizza question is, um, is a hot dog a sandwich? You know, I don't know, but we could have a real conversation about it, right? Like what defines a sandwich? Is it, is it the two pieces of bread? Do you have to split the bun in half into two pieces of bread and then sandwich the hot dog for it to be a sandwich and it's just an open face sandwich if it's split down the middle? Like, we could get into it and it's a stupid conversation, but I'm just going to teach 
how to have an argument and keep the kind of like emotional stakes out of it and we're just going to have fun with a very silly activity and then out of the blue a kid circled back to it and actually made it very real with uh, with gay marriage and and that piece of the conversation um, and I that alone was an important lesson because the the structure of an argument is very much separate from the content of an argument right um, so we can have the same structure and the same arguments and we can just change whatever the subject is and so a bad argument is a bad argument is a bad argument whatever thing we're talking about and I think that's the lesson that they took away from that particular activity Hello? does that answer your question no no <laughs> I have a very different question. I think it's kind of straightforward. Uh, your, the people who come to the camp are teenagers. Mm -hmm. So here's the question. Are they vaccinated? Um, I believe all of them are, yes. So we, we, I particularly run what is our leadership track program. Other organizations, other camps usually call this a counselor in training. But we have kids from eight years old all the way up to, to 17. Um, and we do, yeah, tetanus. We get their vaccination records. We get their medical records. I believe we do require vaccination um, with some exemptions. But we have medical staff that do a full medical review ahead of, ahead of camp and make those determinations. Um, that aspect, I'm not 100% privy on. Do you, do you know? It's my wife. Generally, we're only given that information. Yeah, sure. Hold yeah. on a second. I'll repeat it. I'll repeat it. You repeat it? Yeah. Okay. We're only given that information if it's on a basis, but I think since we are ACA accredited, we have really similar yeah. admittance requirements as public schools do. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what she was saying is she's a little closer to those materials. Um, so we're ACA accredited, which sets a, it's a national standard for, for camps, which is very close to like public school standards. Um, our personal um, exemption requirement is yes you can um, you can input that you have exempted your child from vaccinations for whatever the reason is um, and our medical staff will review that because there are obviously individuals who might be immune compromised we want to be able to provide them an opportunity to come to camp and if it's feasible for us to do so and make those accommodations we'll do so but it, it takes a medical review um, but I think that, yeah, generally tetanus and measles, mumps, rubella, et cetera, um, we require that all of those get vaccinated and are, are sent to camp. Yeah. So how can one uh, find out how to enroll a, a child or a grandchild in the camp or volunteer for staff or donate to the camp? Greg's leading. Um, yeah, so uh, campquestwest.org is our website, newly relaunched and revamped, very pretty now. Um, all the details for the camp are there. Uh, registration is open. We opened it a little bit before Christmas. We had some folks who were giving out registration, send a kid for a week as like a Christmas present or a vacation for the parents. Um, we're always looking for volunteers. You don't have to actually show up to camp and spend a week running around going crazy. Uh, we have a lot of, we're working on our marketing pitches, showing up to events such as this, or writing our newsletter, or if you have a, I'm working, for example, on a curriculum piece right now where I want to, I want to step by step teach the LT kids how to uh, build a Leyden jar so they can store some electricity and then how to use that to discharge into a spark gap and then pick up the actual radio wave signals that get emitted uh, in like an early uh, uh, telegraphy sort of thing. I have learned that creating a spark gap transmitter is a federal crime. So if you know how to do that without violating the law, I would love for you to find me after this. Um, but if you have ideas of just like a cool, this would be really fun. I wish I had known this when I was eight years old and you can get hands on with it and you can build a model rocket or you can make a paper airplane that flies with wings or any kind of fun activity like that write it up submit it to us we'll put it through into our format and then we'll buy the materials or um, you know donate the materials yourself whatever you want to do um, 
you can reach out to us, admin at campquest.org, camp um, and we'll answer any of your questions that you have. And, and uh, we're always accepting just donations of send a kid to camp. Um, we also just offer tiered pricing. We have parents that want to send their kids. That's where their friends go now because they've been going for so many years. We, I think I did the math. Uh, we have an 80% retention rate. If you come for two years, then 80% of the time you'll continue to come until you age out of the program. Um, and we're, the problem that we're facing right now is the, the bottom of the pipeline where the eight-year-olds are. And it's a, it's a weird question to ask and go on the internet and be like, where are all the eight-year-olds to send to summer camp? And then the FBI agent that monitors your Google searches is like, what is this guy doing? You know, and, um, it's a joke. I know it's the CIA. <laughs> all the way in the back here. Um, so I have a question about a specific uh, slide that you had, the one with the graphs uh, the, of the low and the high cognitive ability. Um, and specifically, what are the numbers on the side? Ah. And then the other part is, at least on the paranormal belief ones, it looks like actually with more value placed on rationality, they increase their belief in paranormal beliefs yeah, like slightly. A, I can send you the study. It's, it's actually really fascinating. Um, the, the numbers on the side are Thanks, it's like a Likert Molly scale of, you know, you, you, you survey, if anyone ever has done like political surveys or anything like that, I very much, I sort of, I'm neutral, I'm very supportive of, I'm, I'm super whatever. So they would ask those questions such as, you know, do you believe that uh, ghostly apparitions are real and are like spirits of the dead or something like that, right? And then you would answer like very much, not at all, uh, you know, absolutely 100% true, somewhere on that scale. And then they would take your answers and kind of like, on an average, how much do you very much believe in what we classify as paranormal activity? Uh, and then that was a scale of one to four. And conspiracy beliefs that were a little more granular because they did sort of a meta-analysis of studies of that effect. And um, yeah, and the graph that's actually in the study itself is way harder to read than this one. <laughs> But um, that was my best approximation of it. Uh, and yeah, I think when you go back to the, the paranormal beliefs, basically what they found was that how smart you were, like based on analytics and IQ tests that they provided, just did nothing to change whether you believed in ghosts or whether you believed in the CIA monitoring your Google searches or something like that. Um, and we've seen that in just life. I think that there was a... A NASA astronaut who came back and now writes books about the devil that he saw in space and, you know, like the ghosts and things like that. Like, you can be a smart, trained, educated person and still believe some pretty wild, crazy stuff. Um, and a lot of the reason that you have those crazy beliefs is usually some sort of moral motivated underpinning, right? You get some kind of value for believing that, a community develops around you, and now you've got these people rallying at your back going like, yeah, 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 this guy knows what he's talking about. You're like, I do know what I'm talking about, thank you. Yeah, demons, they're, they're getting all of us, right? Like, um, you have a question? Hi, Dana St. George. Um, yeah, I wondered if you get any international uh, campers. And um, uh, one of the reasons, and, and if their um, vaccination requirements are different than American ones because uh, my son was born in, in Geneva a very long time ago mm -hmm. and uh, they were still vaccinating for smallpox mm -hmm. and it came back to this country and the vaccination schedule was quite different and I guess I was kind of surprised at the number had greatly increased from when I was a kid which is also a long time ago and we just had all these diseases you know <laughs> chicken pox mumps whatever measles and you know and uh, and now they vaccinate for so many things and anyway so I you know I brought it to my pediatrician I you know I said you know they're still vaccinating for smallpox and I said I'm actually kind of scared of smallpox I've heard terrible things about it and can can my son get that vaccination he said oh no that's ridiculous smallpox doesn't exist anymore <laughs> it's been completely eradicated here yes yeah. um, we do receive every once in a while there'll be a, an international camper who might come in um, more frequently we have campers who come in from other states 
uh, we've had staff, I know one staff member in particular who has the smallpox vaccination scar from Iran from a child. Um, and so I don't know their particular medical history, but I know that it was provided as part of our, our background check for, for staff. Um, so our vaccination requirements and other medical history um, that you have to provide remains the same. We don't have exceptions or, or um, differences for international campers or staff. Um, but those cases are, are rare enough. We're not such a large program, our particular affiliate anyway, that you know if somebody from Iran heard about us and wanted to fly out and was a ACE staff member and was willing to pay for their own flight, um, then you know we would review that and, and have an internal discussion and look at what our um, policies and practices are to ensure that we can remain compliant and you know ensure that we're insured for that and, and things of that nature. Um, but we don't have a specific, you know, people coming in from Bali need to have these X, Y, and Z vaccinations before they can get hands on with kids, etc. We would have to look at that holistically and make a determination. I have a question. I'm Ray. I have a question on the uh, consequences of having people at your camps that are both from religious backgrounds or parents that are non-religious and other kids whose parents are religious and they, you know, are just more interested in the science aspects of it. Yeah. And does that lead to any uh, arguments or other uh, unpleasantries with, you know, some kids saying they're right, there is a God, and others saying, no, there isn't one? Yeah. Um, that's a, it's a really good question. On the, on the adult side of things, so for staff, volunteers, um, I know for a fact that a number of volunteers that I've recommended that have come to the program don't in any way consider themselves a humanist or a skeptic or an atheist and, and have some sort of religious belief. And absolutely, you know, nights off in the lodge when all the kids are down, people will have conversation about that. And um, I've, I've never seen it get particularly heated. Um, because we're all adults, uh, and if you're not acting like an adult, we'll send you home or make you sign up as a camper. Um, but uh, among the among the campers, you know, I, they're kids. They don't really dive into Jesus is real or not. They're more likely to argue about you took my sleeping bag and peed on it or something. Um, but conflict. 100% comes up and that's part of the community building that we deal with is if you have a disagreement whether it's a deep philosophical agreement about pineapple on pizza or Jesus is real or whatever the view is um, how do we teach you to uh, express that how do we teach you to receive that and and provide it back and communicate that in a positive effective way um, a lot of our programs deal with that all of our staff undergo de-escalation training and childhood development training, anti-bullying training um, to, to recognize and isolate or um, redirect that sort of attention and then come back to it 10 minutes later when things have calmed down a little bit and talk to the kid, you know, why do you think that they were reacting so negatively to your behavior or why, were you, why was this question so important to you that you needed this answer from them, you know, and um, yeah, I have never personally seen a, uh, you know, I believe in, in, in Jesus and Christ is my Savior argument break out at camp um, because it's just, it's not part of the conversation. You know, a kid can, I'm going to get my dinner and I'm going to sit down at my table with my camp at dinner and I'm going to have a little prayer. And if kids are like, what are you doing? You pray before your dinner? That's so weird. And we have the staff that step in and say, like, hang on. They can pray before their meal. They're not bothering you. And if they are bothering, if they're saying their prayer and they're like, dear God, I hope everyone here burns in hell. And this place should be struck by a meteor and I'm willing to take that for the team. You know, right? We might pull that kid aside and be like, why are you trying to get us all killed here? Right? Like, that's the conversation we're having and, and not 
do you you have to believe one way or the other that's just not not part of things Go ahead. yeah uh, Jerry grass again um, so uh, an important part of all this is is the critical thinking mm -hmm. do, does anybody do any studies to see how well it's taken you know when they've been out of the program for a while <clears throat> studies no don't have the funds for a study and I don't know who the control group would be but um, but we do we do look at uh, I guess the most natural study that we have is last year 50 percent of our returning volunteer staff are graduates from the leadership program that we operate so campers that go through our program and have you know I've had kids that have literally started when they were eight and the person I'm thinking of right now I think is 24 and they're our director of marketing you know the the kids that come and stay and stay involved um, is one feedback mechanism that we have that we know that we're building a community that is trying to self sustain it self be self sustaining uh, and the second piece I have is I know that these young kids um, have like Instagram group chats and like shared phone group chats all the modern communication mechanisms so the end of a week they all share here's my email here's my phone number here's my whatever ID on whatever program this is and they come back the next year and I'm like hey how's you guys going have you seen each other and like oh yeah we met up two months ago we did went to a water park we did this thing we had all this fun and they like you know share in a very modern way that kids get involved that isn't necessarily directly face to face um, and so that tells me that we're building a community of of people that are going to stay together for some period of time and you know when we ask them um, one one particular example is from the last year um, Camp Quest West two or three years ago implemented a, a gender inclusive cabin for our campers and staff who do not feel that they fall within a boys cabin or a girls cabin which has traditionally been the way that we've separated by just to keep things under control you know like eight-year-old boys go over there eight-year-old girls go over here and you know it's easier than just like crazy fighting in between and keeping track of everyone and we, we found staff and campers that said well I don't know that I belong in the girls cabin necessarily so we have a gender inclusive cabin we have policy we do informational outreach to parents it's an opt-in thing so if your kid feels that they want to be in that cabin to be supportive of a friend or because they feel like they don't belong in either other cabin you can opt right into that no problem and we realized this year that we had never written an official policy on where transgender staff shower and the shower facilities that we have are very open there's like a curtain on a rod and they're all you just kind of like six people in there and just sort of do your best to not be naked in front of people shower facilities and if you opt into a cabin that's fine but no one opted in to like their eight-year-old son being exposed to a vagina in the boys bathroom by mistake right so what is our policy how do we deal with this um, and we didn't have any clear answers but I asked our leadership kids because a number of them are in that cabin they're very politically interested and we said we, we'd been having a lesson on what was the difference between justice and what was the difference between revenge and which one was better and weirdly they were all pro revenge justice was is, I'll talk about that in a second but so we said okay you guys think it's so easy to just like solve a moral problem just just like take a knife to it and it's done right here's a you know here's an ethical question do we have an obligation to make everyone feel safe and comfortable and secure at camp versus parents who sign their kids up and may not want them exposed to a particular thing like how do we weigh these scales and they said well what's the current policy we printed the current policy and gave it to them and they just started making edits and said oh this is garbage this is trash and I said okay write me a new one propose it to the board and then we'll debate it and we'll come back to you for drafts and edits and then we'll try to implement it and so um, legally we don't have any contact with campers because they're underage um, but through parental proxies I believe that there's five or six of them that are working on a second draft of that right now um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what they have and if we can implement some changes and updates to the system um, written by our 15 year olds I'm looking forward to to that that's how we that's how we study whether we're succeeding